Well, I'd better see if the top fits. Put it on carefully. Tuck the cable out of the way. Well, <laughs> hey, I think that's all right. Now, this is the cover that goes over all the electrical bits and pieces underneath the keyboard stand and there's some air holes in it to allow for ventilation. I've got the transformer uh, for the LED lighting and I'm also going to put the uh, power supply for the uh, keyboard itself in here. Now I don't want uh, spiders and things to crawl in, in here uh, and so I'm going to put some of this uh, insect screen uh, on uh, here uh, to really dissuade anyone else from entering. Now I had this idea for the music rest to create something that actually looked like a piece of music and uh, the music rest I wanted to be quite wide so I can have more than one book on there at a time because I'm lazy and um, so I thought well if I CNC some music into the surface uh, and then filled the engraving effect of the CNC with some uh, black ep epoxy resin and then sanded it off it would actually look like black notes on white paper. Um, I've tried it and unfortunately failed because partly because I can't get uh, the definition of the music quite good enough um, for the CNC but the file size has got a bit too big uh, for my uh, G-code sender on the uh, XCARV CNC. So I thought well I wonder if there's another solution and uh, I saw a video about a guy called Seth Rowland. Uh, the video was made by Fine Woodworking in America uh, and this guy is using wood in a, an amazing way. He's cutting it uh, not all the way through uh, on his bandsaw, cutting it in strips and, and those strips can then expand like a concertina. And I've done a, a, a piece here. Uh, I've cut this through uh, almost all the way through in one direction, almost all the way through in the other and this is the sort of effect that you get. Uh, and this can be uh, held out, uh, put into a frame. In my case, my idea is to put it into a frame. Uh, and then you have a, a pretty rigid structure uh, for the background of, of a music rest. I know it doesn't look very musical, but it does look uh, quite fascinating. Now I've taken my uh, piece of wood that I'm gonna use and I've made a little uh, tongue all the way around and the idea of that is it, the whole thing is going to sit in a frame because uh, it would be a little bit too flimsy on its own and this is what I've set up here. First of all um, I need uh, some form of stop so that uh, I can avoid going all the way through uh, or going too far. The next thing to work out is how many saw cuts I can have across here. Now we want this to be symmetrical so therefore the first saw cut has to be from this end, from here say, and the last one has to be from uh, this end, the same distance in uh, and going from the same side. So then when it's expanded it will be symmetrical. Now if you look at my practice go it is uh, theoretically symmetrical in that uh, uh, they, they both start uh, with a cut from this top edge here uh, except uh, it wasn't done very accurately. Now when I made this one I used a pitch of four millimeters and I used the scale on the bandsaw uh, to uh, do my cuts. So this time I want to be even more precise and I've got a method it looks uh, rather crazy at the moment but uh, I've got some spacers. So I'm going to leave my fence in the position it's in now and then against the fence I'll put a spacer. Now uh, I've got a, a bunch of these which are four millimeters thick uh, and then I've got uh, two which are uh, 40 millimeters thick and I've got this one which is 80 and with that combination I can cover the full width that I need. Now in order to get the fence in the right place I have to make sure uh, that uh, the number of cuts I'm going to do is an odd number. The first cut will be without any spacers so therefore the final cut needs to be with an even number of spacers. The reason being that the first cut has none, so that's one, and then an even number added to one will be an odd number. I have done a little bit of jiggery-pokery and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the 
four millimeter spacers just here. I've got both of the uh, 40 uh, millimeter and the, and the uh, 80 millimeter one. And the idea is that this would be set up for the final cut. And I've measured that distance there, and that's about 5.1 millimeters. And I'm now going to place this next to it here. And I'm just going to check. And that is about the same. So that's the, the way I've checked. I've got this against the fence, which will be for uh, the first cut. And this is how it will be set up for the final cut. And, and so we should be good to go. I've tested everything by having all my spacers in place and I'm just, just checking, yep, that's going to be symmetrical. So I can now start adding one spacer at a time and remembering each time to turn this over. Now I want sand between all of these cuts uh, just to smooth them up a bit and so I've set up this very simple uh, little contraption here. It, two pieces of wood, I put a saw cut with the bandsaw down through here. I've got some uh, cheap and cheerful uh, sandpaper and I've uh, double sided sellotaped it so it's uh, uh, back on itself so it's held in there and now I'm just going to see how well I can do this. Well, that seems to work. So just give me half an hour and I'll get this done. So I've machined up the stock as you can see. I've got a channel in the middle and that's going to represent the uh, little tongue uh, that's going to go into the uh, channel on the frame and then I've rounded off the edges here. And this is for two pieces. So I'm now gonna split that down the middle and I've got two bits of stock for those fillets. There we are. Now in order to cut all of these out at the exact size, uh, what I've done is I've set up my own special little zero clearance uh, sort of setup here. Uh, and I've got a stop here which I've painstakingly got to the exact position that I want it in. And then I'm going to do a, a series of cuts. And after each cut, uh, one has to stop. You want to stop. 
the saw down until it's completely stopped. Don't try and lift it, and then you have to very carefully, making sure the saw is stopped, hold the piece down that you've just cut. And then, in order to keep them in the right order, uh, this is a, a piece of wood I had that uh, has double-sided tape on it. And so, if I put that there, that's held in by the double-sided tape. And so I work along there. I have uh, also put numbers on the ones I've already cut. One interesting thing, this is just dry fitted, uh, so all these pieces are loose, but the diagonal integrity across there, if I press quite hard, is amazing. Uh, and yet there's no glue, and the same here. Well, it's time to put the decorative edge now on uh, this, uh, uh, whatever we call this concertina bit. Um, I've already put two pieces on here, which were the simple pieces, and these have been glued and left overnight. And so I can now do the next stage. Now, when I glued these end pieces on, I had to make sure there was a bit of pressure on the inside here and here. And the way I went about that was I put a clamp on each end here, and that's clamping against solid material here. And then, in order to push uh, the middle part against the edging wood, I put in some little spaces in here. Uh, and these were just shoved in, because the clamps are at the end, this then puts some pressure on here. Now in order to cut these mitres really cleanly, I've set up my sacrificial piece here on the capex again. Uh, and uh, I've set this at 45 degrees, obviously. Now, there is a, still a risk of getting breakout with this material. So when you're doing a mitre, I always leave the saw in one position rather than moving it from side to side. But that does mean at one end, you've got to do a cut which goes down and out through uh, the face edge. But I always start with that cut. So this is the underside here. And I'm gonna do my uh, first cut very carefully whilst I've still got enough stock left over. So that if I have to do a second cut to make it even more clean, uh, then uh, I can do so. I took that nice and slowly, and I'll try and show you just how clean uh, that is. Uh, that's fine, and that was the underside, and that's the advantage of using that uh, sacrificial piece underneath. Now, before I can start gluing up, I've got to cut uh, these uh, cross pieces to length, but I don't know exactly how long they should be until I've got all these spaces in. So my first task now is to take the spaces and, and place them uh, in the position that they should be in. Right, those are all in place and they're just dry fitted and uh, just as a confirmatory check, I'm just gonna measure across here. It's 60 and a half millimeters there. And that is probably about 60 and three quarters. Uh, that's really close enough. Uh, now my next stage is uh, to get the pieces cut. To length here and I'm going to do this by a uh, sort of creeping in uh, method. I'm going to cut it slightly large and then I'm going to take a little slither off, try it, uh, take a slither off and so on. Now this is going to be quite a tricky glue up because uh, the actual um, main field here is of course very flexible. And so what I've done is I've got two pieces of um, I think 10 millimeter MDF, one below and one above, and I've clamped it whilst it's in this dry state. And I think that then should hold this outwards. It may not hold the individual uh, loose pieces here in place if I remove them, I'm not worried about that, but it'll keep it open and it should allow me then to insert the top and bottom pieces. Now this really is one of the most difficult glue ups that I've ever attempted. I've put these four clamps at the corners to keep the edging uh, in the same plane uh, because there's a risk that it could just be slightly out and because this is veneered you can't then plane it absolutely flat, uh, not necessarily. Uh, I've got clamps across here to keep this uh, going this way. I've got clamps across there uh, as well. And um, hopefully it's okay. The only problem I've had is I've had no clamps uh, narrow enough to go in uh, between uh, these pieces here uh, to make sure they're fully uh, 
home. And so I've pressed them as hard as I could in my fingers. And then when I've tightened up these two end clamps here, it's brought them together and they seem to be okay. Now the way the music rest works is that it sits normally tucked into the lid and there'll be a, a magnet at the back holding it in place at the bottom. But at the top, it uh, needs to pivot. And in order for it to pivot, I've got a pair of side supports. And the one that goes on the left is going to conceal uh, the wire uh, that goes to the LED lighting, where it goes uh, or comes out from uh, the lid itself. Uh, but enough of that for now. Uh, but it's how we do the pivoting action. What I've done is I've drilled uh, a hole in the top here and the corresponding side there uh, to take a 4mm brass pin, which I've just made up. And that brass pin will uh, run down a channel in uh, the side support. And there'll be a little brass stay at the bottom, uh, which uh, handles the, the movement of the bottom of the, of the uh, uh, music rest. Right. Now I'm making up a jig uh, to make it easier to fit the hinges and I'll be able to cut uh, both lots of recesses uh, from the same jig. Now my um, hinges are 63.5 millimetres across. I'm going to be using a 3 millimetre cutter and I have a 10 millimetre guide bush. Now what you do is you take the size of the cutter away from the size of the guide bush and then add that to the length of the hinge and in that case it comes to 70.5 and that's what that block is. So that's the width of the aperture needed uh, for my jig and I'm now going to glue uh, these pieces of MDF in place here and here and the same at the other end and that way I can guarantee that that is a nice clean square hole uh, where my writer is going to go to do that uh, recess work. And that's that uh, other end done as well. And on the end of the templates I've got stops and so that fits on perfectly and, and there's virtually no wiggle room and the same template would fit on perfectly here. And in order to position the jig fore and aft I've got some little uh, four millimetre pins uh, that can be uh, pushed in and pushed flush uh, if they get in the way of the router but they're still acting as the locating pins here and I've got uh, more at this other end as well. Right, I've plunged down till my cutter is touching uh, the surface of the wood. Uh, I've then placed the hinge in here, set the depth adjuster, that means now when I do the full plunge it'll be the thickness of the hinge. My jig is held in place with these two clamps uh, I have set up my writer, so here we go. That's done, I'll just check with my hinge. And that's super. And I just have to take out the tiny round element which is in the corner here. And it really is tiny. And there we go, that's our hinge now ready to go in there. Notice I've just marked this left base. That's the left-hand side of the cabinet if you're sitting at the front there. Uh, and this is the base. Uh, when we do the lid, the, the jig has to go the other way up. So that this ends up uh, on the left-hand side of the lid. I've labelled my two hinges A and B in case the layout of the holes is fractionally different. I've known that in the past. Uh, now the one with the letter, the side with the letter on uh, goes on the base and the side without the letter goes on the top. And so I'm going to pop that in there and I'm just going to find my centres now. And now if you look closely you can now see there's my edging strip and my wire is about two, perhaps three millimetres to the right of where that strip ends. So I've just got room, <laughs> just got room uh, for those screws to go in. I've just screwed those uh, hinges in just with a middle screw on each side. Uh, 
and see if it shuts. Oh, ha ha ha. Well, I wasn't expecting it to be quite so easy, but it does. <laughs>